and coachmen. Those principles can be laid out as a spatial game plan for managing Woody and Coachman. We can now take management data and link what's going on on the ground to our priorities and outcomes. So just a few examples of where we've done this in Nebraska. Maybe. Was that only works for you? You got a train? All right, here we go. All right, so what we did was we took tree cover data and we wanted to know how, we wanted to know outcomes. You know, we've been spending millions of dollars to manage woody encroachment. It was brought up earlier that we prioritize the most important answer. Uh, so we looked at where the whole state, uh, 50, 30 meter pixels, baseball diamonds, how has tree cover changed from 2000 to 2017? Everywhere on red in the map shows where we've had an increase in tree cover. We found the same thing that's been kind of, um, we've been finding everywhere in the Great Plains. The areas that are the hardest hit are where we've been spending the most dollars, where we've been prioritizing managing the encroachment. We, did, we found some examples of success. If we zoom in on the less canyons, and this is through partnerships with them, we were able to take their management data and show one of the only successful outcomes we've found in Nebraska. Wait for it. All right, so we have tree cover trends here. Um, for every biologically unique landscape in Nebraska, these are our conservation priority areas in the state. We track all of them. What we see across the state was increasing trends in woody cover. It's like, you know, when, when we went down to Stillwater, Oklahoma to look at what, what's going on there, we can look from east to west in Nebraska and see the same thing happening. The tall grass prairies being hit the hardest or having the, the greatest losses in grass. In, in grass. The short grass prairie was the only eco region without a significant increase in tree cover, our driest grassland region in the state. When we look at the less canyon, so that's this red area right here in central Nebraska, just south of North Platte. We actually saw evidence where they, it's one of the most hard hit areas in the state with woody encroachment. We tracked tree cover change, so this is the woody transition data in red showing the most severe woody dominated area. 2000, a um, lot of infestation in the north. 2005, it's getting worse. 2010, it's sweeping across this whole landscape. 2015, we start to see it, it's, it's halted and 16, we're chipping away. 2017, 18, those are the prescribed burns. So through partnerships with these landowners, we've been able to track where they're managing. And what we've been able to show is one of the greatest conservation success stories in the Great Plains. We wouldn't have been able to, to show what's happening here without this data. So it, it was, it's, been, it's been a really great success story to share throughout the Great Plains. It's one of the few examples we have of where we've successfully managed woody encroachment. And, and they wouldn't call it success. They, they were expecting to see a reversal, um, but given the state of things, halting woody encroachment is a win today um, because no other group has been able to withstand that much woody encroachment and then halt it. That's just one outcome. Um, it's halting a regional scale regime shift. That's really important. But there's also things like wildlife, uh, forage productivity that we care about. We can track those two with these, with these new data products. So we have the American bearing beetle. Um, up until very recently, it was listed as an endangered species. Les Canyons has one of the strongest populations of the American bearing beetle. What this map shows is woody transitions overlaid in green by the, the prescribed fire units and then the circles 
show the mean abundance of the American bearing beetle. What we can actually see is that where they've used their management to halt this transition, they've protected the American bearing beetle. American bearing beetle occur where you have large, large grasslands. By restoring grassland, they've improved American bearing beetle populations. And by preventing that, that red wall from progressing through, they've, they've been able to maintain and stabilize some of the strongest American bearing beetle populations in their area. Caleb Roberts, um, uh, a postdoctoral researcher in the football lab, has actually analyzed this data further. And he's actually shown the American bearing beetle population is slightly increasing in the last 10 years by a few beetles per year. Um, that is a huge win for, a, for an endangered species. In this age, we tend to be losing endangered species. Uh, this is one of the few examples we can point to where we have management that's, that's good for the cow and good for an endangered species. This is one of the few examples where everything can come together. If we want to prioritize our most intact productive grazing, that's good for our wildlife, it's good economically, and it's, it's a solid strategy. Everything kind of lines up here to win. We've also looked at um, management data for the Sandhills Task Force. These are primarily tree removal projects. Um, and what we see here for the first time is a management program that's ahead of the biome line. Everything else we've seen has been, by and large, it's been in the red, it's been in the woody biome. That's where we've been prioritizing management. What we see here is one of the, the first example where we're out in front of the line, we're doing more proactive preventative management before that biome has got that biome line has gotten here. So if we zoom into a project, this was a 2000, 2016 project. Um, and what we're seeing here is categorical tree cover. So in green, we have zero to 1%. That's, that's what we're gonna to refer to as tree length. Um, in orange, we have two to 4% tree cover. And in red, we're, that's where we have higher tree cover, greater than 5%. And so with this project, we're able to show, we had rising tree cover, low, but rising, and our treatment brought it right back down. Now this shows yield. So in blue here, you can't really see it because uh, measured yield and potential yield are the same. So again, we're seeing a treatment was actually implemented before we had losses in yield. One of the few places where we're actually seeing that. Oh, so this, so, so this shows yield gap. Um, we've got the zero mark here. And what we can see is, you know, we're, we're below the zero mark, so we're having, a, we're, we're realizing potential. Um, right until recently, um, we actually saw a yield, a yield gap emerge right at the end there that was restored with the treatment. Here's another example. We have a bigger project. Um, some more complex tree cover. Um, this is a 2018 treatment where you can see they're really targeting uh, this two to four percent uh, tree cover area. So 2017, got a lot of cover up here. Um, treatment implemented, it's cleared, um, and we've been able to maintain that early stage of encroachment and prevent the problem from getting to the point where it's the most expensive to manage. So uh, that's just a, a glimpse at um, some of the things we can do um, through science partnership, tracking management, um, and tracking a spatially implemented strategy. So, I mean, I've been studying things for a long time and Dylan's been able to start breaking this stuff down. Uh, we couldn't see any of this stuff until literally in the last year. So. We can track all treatments that groups are doing. We can track all wildfires, and our lab is published on that for the entire Great Plains. We can track how vegetation is changing in scales and at a time span we've never had before. 
And, and Dylan's just showing like we can track that complexity and you can see what tree cover is doing over time on this landscape. You can also see what our treatments miss. And as we talk about this at two o'clock, we can start to talk about what happens when you leave seed sources. Um, so, so we can just track reality instead of just the generalities that we often do in the science. That's gonna be huge uh, as you all just are looking at how to manage big scale threats going forward. Um, and this is, this is one of the first examples. Uh, we show all that because there's also this, right? We planted the seed of protect the core, defend the core and growing that. The larger the scales, the easier uh, it is to manage these issues. And this is a group where we took some of these ideas down, down in the Gypsum Hills or Red Hills of Kansas. This area here, as we walk through this data, you had a bunch of cedar that then just, you can see this removal. So what I wanna do is show, again, like what Dylan was doing, the outcomes that are now trackable. So if we jump into that part of the world, this is a million acre view across two counties. So this was the scale that that rancher group wanted us to look at. And you can see what it looks like in 2000 and how that warning signal of woody dominance continues to expand, just like these examples Dylan gave. And then there's 2015 and just watch this. Regional scale removal of the woody dominated area. And of course, when I was down there, I just asked them, so what did that? And they said Anderson Creek wildfire. Uh, one of the largest wildfires uh, in the continental US in the last 25 years. And so in this Oklahoma to Kansas area, that's what fire did, right? It took a big chunk out of cedar. And what we usually do is we then wait and then the cedar comes roaring back and we lose yield again. What that group started to do is actually double down and say, why don't we do the did 85% of the work? Why don't we finish the job? Let's not let it come back. Let's not ignore the seed sources. We're going to build a core and their vision down there is a treeless system that is not vulnerable. And this is what it looks like when you build cores. So this Y axis is the yield gap. So since 1990, they're losing yield. That's 2.5 million pounds on a 95,000 acre landowner cooperative or, or network that they put together to say, we're gonna build a core. They sent this to the NRCS saying like, we want to do these kind of approaches and maintain an area that's easier to manage long-term. And what you see here, our peak right here, this is impact drought, right? But this right there, that's about 2.5 million pounds. This is the effect of the wildfire because of all the cedar it killed. And then this is follow-up management. They're back down to 1990 levels of production. It's the first example that I have in the Great Plains of restoring large scale production after it's been lost. It's that hard. So, so what's cool is we've got the we've got examples of, of the Flint Hills, the Les Canyons, the uh, Gypsum Hills of Kansas. There's multiple examples of why thinking bigger and scaling up and working at the boundaries and protecting areas instead of chasing it is working. Uh, we're seeing these lands actually more profitable and on. Uh, and what they want to do is avoid this from playing out again, right? That's now their goal. We don't want to see that ever again. So, uh, if, and what, if we could bring them up, they'd talk about why we should keep the sandhills the way it is and not, right? Like we're doing that in the sandhills. We want to avoid this and learn that history lesson from other places. So I think this is just really exciting because the whole point of this, like we can track outcomes for producers. We can track it for wildlife. Like we can get to the point where we're actually talking about actual benefits, not just how much dollars we're spending treating the problem. So kind of fun to look at and do and put this rangeland analysis monitoring approach in the big picture. Uh, the more I see this, the more I think more groups can do it themselves. We'll come back to this at two, but I think it's great now thinking through uh, and hearing stories about what Nebraska Grazing Lands Coalition, uh, Coalition is doing with burden coordination, uh, hearing from Sarah as well. So I'll turn it over to whoever our MC is. Maybe nobody wants to, it's not gonna be me, Ron. <laughs> oh great so i'll go ahead and unplug and uh look forward to reconvening on some of this stuff at two
Okay, bear with me for just a minute and we'll get set up here on a different computer. All right. So my name is Shelly Kelly, and I am the executive director for the Sand Hills Task Force. And uh, Nebraska Grazing Lands Coalition um, graciously allowed us to, to help sponsor this meeting. Um, we, we've worked together on a lot of different issues, and working on prescribed burning together uh, has been a, a new endeavor, too. But I just wanted to share a little bit of information about the Sand Hills Task Force. Um, thanks for the time. And I appreciate you guys being here, but the Sand Hills Task Force is a nonprofit organization that's rancher led. And that rancher led portion is what makes us really relevant. And uh, it, it uh, has allowed us to navigate the space of, of conservation practice implementation uh, in a way that might make a little bit more sense to ranchers. And uh, the partnerships that we have is the most important thing that's made us successful uh, because we work with so many different people. We work with the NRCS. We work with the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. We work with the US Fish and Wildlife Service, Pheasants Forever. I mean, really kind of anybody that's uh, doing work out here on our landscape, we want to be working with cohesively so that we're not competing against each other. Dirac did a great job of talking about how important it is for uh, research to be a part of this conservation game. And I think it's, it's very safe to say that we partner very well together to try to uh, get information out to ranchers that makes sense and to use the information provided to make, uh, to change how we apply conservation to the landscape. Uh, some of those things, you know, has been uh, when we used to clear cedar trees, do a cedar contract with somebody, uh, we would just clear the, the trees that were available by the machine. And the ones that were on steep slopes, we left in hopes that you know either the rancher would go cut them uh, or that at least we got the majority of them. Well, through research, we realized that we were not doing ourselves any favor. We weren't doing you guys any favor either by doing that. And so when we do a project now, we take every single cedar tree out there. But because we're not government, we've had the ability to do some things uh, a little bit um, more leeway, uh, like remove windbreaks. And when you start talking about removing cedar windbreaks, uh, it gets a lot of people, um, it, it brings about some uncomfortable emotions because uh, somebody planted that windbreak for a purpose. But Decades ago, we were all told to plant trees and we were told to plant trees for the wildlife, plant it for the landscape. It was good for, good for everything to have all these trees out there. We now know that some of those cedar windbreaks could be the demise of our, of our existence as ranchers, of our livelihoods. If we don't take care of those cedar windbreaks, we're not doing ourselves any favor. So, if you have a cedar windbreak that you're not using anymore and it's causing you more problems than it's causing you good, we'd love to help you get rid of it. Um, we, uh, we do a lot of eastern red cedar removal. We do a lot of prescribed burn uh, planning. We'll help plan a burn. We'll help you cost share a burn. Uh, we do stream and wetland work. So we'll do stream and wetland restorations. Uh, lake restorations to get the invasive carp out. So we don't just work in one area. Really the Sand Hills area, we want to, to help make sure the rangeland and the wetlands are functioning and in good shape. And we, if you've got a project out there, we'd just love to talk to you about it. Uh, we have, we have 1.5 million funds available just to help ranchers with projects on their place. And as I said earlier, uh, I made the decision to not apply for more funds this year because we're not spending it fast enough for what we have available. I want you guys to, to change that and I'll get busy writing more grants because there's a lot more money out there that we can be spending in the sand hills uh, with more interest. So uh, I've got the booth set up over here. There's information. I've got a flyer that just talks about some of our general projects. 
Uh, it has my name and contact information at the bottom, and it has Ashley Garl's name and contact information at the bottom too. She's our project coordinator, and she's the one um, on the ground working with folks. And uh, either one of us would love to talk to you about a project. Uh, take some additional copies. If you've got some neighbors or friends or family that needs this information too, uh, you know, share it on with them. Um, we, I, I made mention that we did a direct uh, mailing in Loop County and we're building our, our mailing distribution list uh, all the time. And we're gonna start doing more direct mailings to get information out there about projects, to get information out there about just overall cedar control and why people need to be paying attention to it. But we've got some campaigns starting. This, you know, be a leader, kill a cedar. Um, we're looking at uh, different ways to really uh, make some catchy slogans, get more people interested in, in killing cedar trees. If you have a really good idea of how you think we can uh, share this message, please come share it with me. And uh, I'd love to get it out there, but grab some koozies. Uh, we do have them printed out like that. We've got some stickers over there too. And then I've just got an overall brochure. So uh, thanks so much for the time to get to talk about our organization. And uh, I hope Every time I'm at one of these meetings, I get really inspired. I get that fire in my belly and I just wanna, wanna do even more uh, to help protect the sand hills and, and help protect the ranchers out here um, that call this place home. We live in a, in a wonderful area and I hope that our kids and our grandkids uh, have the same opportunity that we've been afforded, but it's gonna take work. It's gonna take work from all of us. So I hope you guys feel that same energy that that I get when I'm at these meetings and I look forward to the rest of the day because I know that we've got good information coming up and opportunities uh, to learn more from you. So the more information you can give us, the better we're gonna do for you. Thanks, Ron. Do you have a presentation or are you just, okay, yep. Yeah, I'm Alex Peterson. I'm one of two burn bosses for the Nebraska Grazing Lands Coalition. Uh, the other one is Doug Wisenhunt down by North Platte. Uh, to get started, I'll talk about uh, just what uh, we accomplished in 2020 so far as far as burning um, for this area. Uh, I was involved in 11 different prescribed burns Uh, totaling around 5,500 acres. Um, of those burns, I was a burn coordinator, which included writing the burn plan, um, being the burn boss on the day of the burn on seven of those burns. Um, the rest, I either provided uh, NGLC equipment or was just a crew member adding knowledge to the to the day, uh, running a drip torch or spraying water. Um, of the 11 burns that, that I was part of, the average size was 500 acres. Uh, the biggest one was around 1,700 acres and the smallest was around 35 acres. So pretty big gap there. Um, additional to <laughs> Additional to the ones that I was involved in, uh, there was also about 2,500 acres burned in Garfield and Wheeler County. Custer County burned around 4,000 acres. And I know there was also some burning going on in Blaine County. Um, there was a burn last week north of Burwell. Um, so, so far, in central Nebraska, we burned around 13,000 acres in 2020. Um, the other burn boss, Doug Wisenhunt, uh, participated in over 20,000 acres in southwest Nebraska around the Lowest, Lowest Canyons area. And those were mainly with burn associations. And they had one fire that was 3,500 acres. So. Burn associations generally equal more acres burned. Um, 
So that's where we where we're at. I'd like to see those numbers grow as uh, we go forward and more people are burning. Um, so that's I'll get into what what we can offer for NGLC. Um, the goal by having burn coordinators in place is to make landowners feel more comfortable with using prescribed fire. As we talked about earlier, that there's a lot of older generation ranchers out there that have their whole life, fire was evil, you'd wanna put it out right away. And so it's convincing those guys that they that we're starting to see a problem now and their first question is where do we start um whether it be they don't know what resources are available uh, the liability involved um, is there cost share out there it's, it's stuff like that that if they come to me i can lead them in any one of those directions. Um, I work with the NRCS and Burwell quite a bit. Uh, they put my name out there. Uh, Sand Hills Task Force, Pheasants Forever. We all work together. And you don't have to use cost share. Uh, out of the 11 burns we did, there was probably three that just did it on their own, at their own expense. And if you can afford to do that, that's also a great way to go. You're not in a contract or anything, but but you're also not getting paid. So um, neighbors burning is the best way to get introduced to fire. So once it starts in your area, you see your neighbor and how good it was, then almost always the other neighbor wants in on it in the future. There is instances where I know out in our area, there are still several neighbors that absolutely are scared to death of it, regardless if every one of their neighbors has burned. They just, it's just the way, the way it is, I guess. Um, but I have never heard of anybody around here that has done a fire and has said, I'm never doing that again. So that's a good sign. And uh, they, they almost always right away plan on doing one in the future. Um, so if you are interested in burning and you wanna get a hold of me, um, we can assist in planning for your future burn. It can be years out or it can be months out, just depending on on when you get the the idea to do it. Um, I'll come out and visit your area, uh, provide recommendations to you, and I can help conduct the prescribed burn. As we talked earlier, there's a limited number of burn days if you're only looking at spring burns. So I might not be able to be there for every burn day, but I can sure get you up to that point lead you to resources for equipment, um, crew members that can help out. Um, NGLC does have a burn trailer and, and I'm in possession of that. We, I have three slip-in units, drip torches, PPE, um, just stuff that is free to use. So get a hold of me, that stuff's available, uh, hand tools, weather instruments, all kinds of stuff. Um, we do require the landowner to sign a, a liability waiver. And I, I have a copy of that if anybody wants to look at it. It's nothing serious. I've never had anyone decline on signing it. It's it just <laughs> better safe than sorry. Uh, recommend that they, well, basically it, um, it's declaring that the landowner is taking responsibility of the fire and it, that they are expected to pursue any cost share 
agreements on their own. NGLC does not provide cost share like Sandhills Task Force does. We just provide uh, equipment and coordination of the fire itself. Um, the landowner is responsible for lining up the help, but like I said, I have a good list of people um, and fire departments, lots of people with experience. Um, so that's not totally on the landowner. I can sure help there. Um, and after the burn is done, the, the landowner is in charge of monitoring the burn. I can't stick around for multiple days, um, but I would say that given that <laughs> there's limited amount of burn days, I prefer if you want to get a hold of me and come look at your place that we do it months in advance of actually lighting the fire rather than a week before. Uh, just not enough time to get a good plan in place and look at the whole property. There's going to be prep work that needs done and burn plan that needs that's written and approved and burn permits. Um, all that stuff needs to happen. Um, yeah, so once I'd come look at your area, there's going to be in this area, there's going to be trees that need cut on the boundaries and almost all of them, hopefully not. But for prep work, you want to make a boundary around the perimeter of the fire. So if there's large trees, you want to cut them off the, the boundary, take them in several hundred feet. Uh, if you if you cut the trees a year before, then you want to go ahead and burn them piles up before we do the burn, unless they're well interior, so we don't have embers going over. And and generally, you want to do a mow line around, mow the grass down short, uh, 20 to 30 feet, and that gives a good perimeter for the trucks to put down wet lines, and just a good control line basically is that what you're looking for is there any other questions similar to that of what i've covered so far <laughs> i'm kind of running right through it but um i did what we kind of talked about earlier is we're just not burning enough acres to to change the, the invasion of cedars. And so my goal in this area is to make these burns larger. Um, like I said, we, we've, the smallest one I did was 35 acres. Well, it takes just as long to do a 35 acre burn. It takes the day to do it as it does to do a 1500 acre burn. And when you're limited on burn days, you're not gonna, burn the amount of acres you want to in a year to really put a dent in the system at all. Um, there is, I just talked with Ben Wheeler this week with Pheasants Forever. Um, they have a program to encourage large burns. Um, it can be multi landowner and the, they have to be at least 500 acres but the funding goes really quick. The last three years they've used up their funding. And so you, if anybody is interested in that with their neighbor, you think you have 500 acres that could be burned, I can point in the right direction there, but you have to sign up for that one pretty quick. Um, but there's funding available, like for fire. If you yeah. Yeah, there, there's multiple places to sign up to get to get funds. Sandell's Task Force, NRCS. Um, I know the NRCS is going to really be pushing for brush control in the future. Um, hopefully, lots of people can get into those programs. Pheasants Forever, like I said, has this. You, you should be able to get cost share on any burning you want to do. So. So get on it and get a hold of me if you want me to come look at your place. It doesn't matter 
what agency it's for. I, I've done several for NRCS. I've done them if you're not contracted at all. So um, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about burn associations um, where Doug Wisenhut, they burned down there with several burn associations. Like I said, they burned over 20,000 acres this year because they can get them larger fires and that's multi landowner fires. And I don't know if there's interest in this area for burn associations, but the proof is out there that if a burn association is in place, more acres will get burned because if your neighbor has burn equipment, they're going to want to burn. So we kind of got an informal, <laughs> you could kind of call it informal burn association. It's more Garfield County kind of uses their fire department. Luke County uses their fire department, but it's, it's mostly fire department owned equipment. There is uh, getting to be more and more privately owned equipment, which is good to see. Um, so if there's any interest in, in that, um, or if anybody has a comment on, on that, you can sure bring it up now. Um, if there's pros and cons about pro burn associations, I know we're central Nebraska is kind of one of the, if you look at the burn association map of Nebraska, central Nebraska is kind of the area where there isn't one yet. So, um, Yeah, good. Um, what about cross fences and neighbor fences? Yeah, if, if it's cross fenced, um, I mean, if you're most generally, if it's out cross fence out in the middle, that's where the fire will be moving fairly quickly. And cross fences usually don't get harmed that much at all. It's where the if there's trees in your fence line, then yeah, it, it'll be pretty hard on the on the post and maybe even the wire. But I've never had any problems with cross fences burning up. And of course, on your boundary, usually you follow fence lines on your boundaries, and the trucks are right there. They can spray the post if if needed. And so. well, uh, you're talking about wood posts and barbed wire. Correct. But obviously, interior temporary fences on a plastic post. Yeah. Right, yeah, plastic post, yeah, I would. About the interior high pencil wire, is it damaged or? No, not that, not that I've ever heard of. I, like I said, the fire's moving quick enough. It's only hot for a few seconds, unless, it, unless it's full of trees. Then, I mean, it takes a pretty good temperature and it has to be hot for a while to to damage that wire i mean even even barbed wire the bottom wire down in in the grass and the really old rusty brittle stuff it, it's kind of hard on that stuff but in general that's the least of a rancher's concerns really Yeah, 
and more questions. I'd like you had a number of activities planned for this last summer, which uh, put on hold for COVID. So share some of those for you. Yeah, uh, I was in the process of lining up uh, a tour, basically, if we could get uh, people who are interested in burning um, to tour around. We had several fires north and, and east of town um, to tour around to those different burn areas for anyone that was interested. And hopefully we can, we can do that in the future um, just so they can really see how good it does. And, and if, if there's anybody who's interested in, in seeing one done before they pull the trigger on doing their own, just get a hold of me. Um, you can sure come out and observe. I know sometimes you don't want too many just looky loos people driving down the road when you're trying to do a burn. But if, if you're interested in seeing how it's coordinated, it'd be really eye opening to see that it, we're not just going and just lighting stuff on fire. It's really organized. People that are there know what they're doing. We've worked together and it would be a good eye opener for someone who is on the fence or is just scared, frankly, to even do it. Um, we can make it happen if you want to watch. I might make a comment. Uh, uh, sometimes you don't always get your big trees cut down, and we've done some of that in our own uh, on our ranch where the big trees would get cut down, and they went ahead and and it's a deep canyon, so on and so forth. And so then you have another development remaining, but I'm going to talk about regaining the prairie lands. But yes, yeah, so within a year or less, the grass, uh, they go out and look at those skeletons that are dead and they're standing in 20 feet tall. The grass is going to put back in the trunk and the, and the prairie is going to be being by just getting rid of the green off the, by killing that tree. Um, it's kind of ugly for the landscape and the roots and the to do it, have someone come out and clear those skeletons for you and, and reburn and then you take care of it. It just shows you how fast once that tree tree was dead, that the prairie grass is going to go through that trunk. The cows are going in there and grazing that um, grown blue grass or whatever some of the native grasses also that come right up there. It's amazing. I was, I was shocked when I looked at our after I burned and, and within a year or two of course I was up even and that grass has come back because there's no longer a big old tree or something there that uh, yields and, and feeds. But with the short time that the prairie has been regained, so uh, it's kind of scary to have big trees grow in the plains. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I just, it was amazing to me how fast the prairie regained uh, its uh, power, I guess, after that tree was gone. Yeah, so for those on online, we just had a, a landowner uh, describing after the fire how fast the prairie regains it, itself and the grass comes back. And uh, I think all landowners who have done a burn in the past can can share their stories on how how it's changed their land um, in, in a positive way and saved them a lot of time and effort. It's uh, by far the cheapest route to controlling your cedars. And one time I heard the, the cedar sucks up 46 gallons of water um, a season or whatever. I mean, I'm sure it's depending on the size of the tree, but you just think about it, not just killing the shading out and crowding out, but all the moisture that's going to keep that tree alive. And instead, then you have to grow the grass. Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, she was, made a comment about cedar trees sucking up all the groundwater from your pasture. And yeah, I think if, if you go out in any of these rangelands where there's maybe a, a very large tree and then a, a 10 foot gap and then another very large tree, there's hardly any grass between them. I mean, it stays really short. And riparian areas, you hear stories of of them just going dry because they're they're so full of trees. I know even along the 
the Platte River, they say the amount of water that goes to eastern Nebraska is way less because of all the trees, cedar trees and, and cottonwoods and stuff. Um, one story uh, on some ground we rent, there's a pond out in the hills between a bunch of hills. And this is an area where the pond eventually had dried up and it was full of cedar trees and stuff. Just in the last three years, we have clear cut all the trees and then we did a burn. It would have been two, two springs ago. And even as dry as it was this, this summer towards the end, it still had water in it because there wasn't just gobs of cedar trees there.